Catholic Family Podcast presents Lent Around the World Daily Traditional Catholic Meditations Read by our friends from across the globe The Passion and Death of Our Lord Jesus Christ by the Most Reverend Albin Goodyear Part 33 The Third Word Behold Thy Son by this time, the crowd, as is want of crowds, was becoming weary of its own ribaldry. We have noticed how throughout the morning its number could never have been overwhelming. During all this turmoil in the upper quarter of the city, business in the streets went on as before. Since the final condemnation by Pilate, the mob had dwindled still more. The morning was advancing. There was much to be done that day. The chief interest in this trial was over. Many did not care to be involved in what was to follow. Both before the Roman governor and here around the knoll of Calvary, they were the cries of the leaders of the people that were chiefly heard. The rest followed after, taking up the cry from them, with that brutal, irresponsible cruelty which is common with a mob, but with thoughtlessness more than with malice. But even the leaders, too, were beginning to tire of their work. They had attained their end. They had seen their victim crucified before their eyes. They had secured the death of his body, and there was no more that they could do. At once there had come that sense of satiety, of disgust, of self-contempt, which is the sequel of realized guilt. They awoke from their delirium of hatred, and they despised themselves for what they had done. Jesus of Nazareth had been put to shame before all the world, but in their hearts they knew well with whom the shame lay. For a time, as we have seen, they made a brave show. But their very vehemence betrayed them. They shouted and blasphemed round Calvary more violently, more recklessly than ever they had done before, even during all that day. But the bravado could not endure. The figure on the cross that deigned no reply, not even recognition, made all their insult hollow. Already, many had begun to leave the scene. They hastened to distract themselves with other things from the thought of the ghastly specter that now haunted them. It was the eve of the great Sabbath day. Both in the temple and in the bazaar there was much to be done before evening, prayers to be offered in thanksgiving, offerings to be purchased and made for the fulfillment of the law and the honor of Jehovah. Hence the crowd around Calvary soon became less turbulent. There was a lull, and the hours began to drag as the onlookers waited for the end. The guard became less careful. They had done their work, which could not be undone, and it mattered little now who approached the criminals. Gradually, a group drew near. It consisted chiefly of women. Among them, St. John mentions three, or it may be four. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. We might dwell long on the composition of this group and the forces that brought them to witness this scene of horror. That his mother should be there does not surprise us, though we may well wonder that such a thing could have been permitted by the most callous of men. A mother, and such a mother, witnessing her son, and such a son, bleeding to death before her eyes, dying as a common criminal, with blasphemies hurtling around her, and she could do nothing. It had come at last. During all the three and thirty years before, she had known that the end would be something terrible. Since the day when she first nursed her child in the rock chamber at Bethlehem and swathed his helpless body and laid it in the hay in the manger, she had known that through many tribulations her son must win his way to the throne of David, his father. She had never forgotten what the holy man had said that day when, in accordance with the law, she had offered him to the father in the temple. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and for the resurrection of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be contradicted, and thy own soul a sword shall pierce 
that out of many hearts thoughts may be revealed. She had fled with that child away into a foreign land with bloodshed in her wake. Almost from the first, the joy of motherhood had been marred by this agony. Her own child's life had brought death to many children, desolation to many mothers. She had brought him back from exile in fear and trembling, longing to live in Bethlehem, the home of David, but they dared not, hiding at last in Nazareth, the village of no repute, lest evil men might again discover him and seek his life. Once she had lost him for part of three days. The memory of that could never be forgotten. It remained as a warning to her, a foreshadowing of the greater separation that one day must be. Always she had kept it in mind, pondering it in her heart. Always she had feared when and how the end would come. This woman of few words, but deep understanding, had often prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. But not before, she had also said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. Not my will, but thine be done. When at length, after thirty years, he had left her, and had gone out to preach the kingdom, her agony had only increased. Twice at least she had been made to wonder whether the end was there. Once in Nazareth his fellow citizens had sought to take his life, men whom she had known in her daily intercourse, men who had spoken of her as being nothing worth. And she had trembled with fear in her cottage as an angry, blood-seeking crowd hustled him past her door. Again, one day in Capernaum, when he had been first charged with working by Beelzebub, the prince of devils, there had been trouble in the town, and she had run out to him, fearing the worst. Since that time she had seen him, now in exile beyond Galilee, because even there men plotted his death and he was no longer safe, now delaying in Perea to avoid his Judean enemies, now hiding in Ephraim or in the wilderness, when he came up to Jerusalem, never spending a night within its walls. She had noticed all these things. Even had no other light been given to her, her mother's heart could not but notice them. Her own son was hated by her own people. Her own son's life was in danger. Her own son wept because he was rejected, and her heart bled for him. She said not a word of her sorrow and her fears to others, as she had said not a word to Joseph of her earliest joys. Still, within herself, Mary kept all these words, pondering them in her heart. Indeed, she had long since seen what the inevitable end would be. She had no delusions like those of the apostles concerning the founding of a kingdom. If one such as Judas foresaw the coming doom, Mary, the lover of humanity, foresaw it even more. She who had read the scriptures so well could not fail to have discovered the repeated warnings concerning her son. Still, she had followed wherever he had led, silently waiting in Nazareth, silently watching in Capernaum, pierced to the heart by every rejection till the last rejection should come. She had followed him in this last journey to Jerusalem and now even to Calvary, knowing that so it must be. And it had come at last, here, in this terrible way. And she, the mother who had nursed him and clothed him as a child, could only stand there and do nothing. There were other women at her side, some at least of those who had been her constant companions during the last two years. They had followed her son in Galilee, ministering to his wants. Now, when they could minister no more, they would at least stay with him while he died. Among them, we might have been sure beforehand, was Mary Magdalene. A week ago, at the supper in Bethania, she had poured out her precious spikenard upon him, and when men who understood not complained, he had read her heart more truly. She had done it for his burial. Her name should never be forgotten to the end of time. With the group was also the disciple John, the son of thunder, the one who claimed for himself that Jesus loved him and who could presume upon that love. 
little more than a week before, on the way up from Perea, his mother had come to the king that soon was to be. She had petitioned of him that her sons might sit, the one on his right hand and the other on his left, in the kingdom. He had warned them what such an honor might imply. He had told them that it was not his to give, but that it belonged to the father. Still, would he give them what he could? He would give them a share in his chalice. Now, he was fulfilling that promise to his beloved John. And even as John drank, though he realized it not, he was standing with his king on his right hand in the kingdom. It would not have been possible for this mighty lover of mankind to ignore this group of his own that had come so near to be his companions as he lay stretched on his bed of death. Cost what it might to his tortured body, though the blood streamed down and almost blinded him, his eyes opened and looked at them. We have seen often enough the human love of Jesus Christ. He who had come not to destroy but to perfect had not destroyed the love of man and woman by making it divine. He had dear friends in Bethania. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary. In Perea, when a young man had come to him, we were told, Jesus looked on him and loved him. When Lazarus lay dying, his sisters had appealed to the human heart of Jesus in their message, He whom thou lovest is sick. And when at length he came to his dead friend's grave, his weeping made those who stood by say, Behold how he loved. During all the early part of this day of suffering, we had proof of the love of him who loved his own who were in the world and loved them unto the end. He had called them not servants but friends. He had called them his little children. He had asked them for their love. He had bid them love one another. When the torrent of sorrow broke over him, he had asked them, as a friend might ask a friend, not to leave him, to stay with him. Even when the worst befell him, when one of his own turned traitor, even then his human love would not die, but would still call the traitor friend. Now on Calvary, that human heart was still the same. He saw his mother standing before him, the valiant woman, erect, motionless, almost expressionless, with scarce a tear in her eye. There are griefs that lie too deep for tears, and a mother's broken heart is one. If Jesus could say, the Father and I are one, he could say something akin of his relation with his mother. If he could pray for his own whom he had chosen, that they all may be one in me, and could ask that where he was they also might be with him, among them all, of none was this more true than of his chosen mother. If he could say, Greater love than this no man hath, that he lay down his life for his friend, he knew that in no one could this be more proved than in his mother. She had given him life. She had lived wholly for him, the handmaid of the Lord. Gladly now would she die for him. Not only would she gladly die, during these three and thirty years they had so lived together, their lives had been so intertwined, the union of mother and son, of son and mother, had been so complete, that if we speak of nature only, even in death, they would not be separated. We have known of those who, in life, have so grown together that the death of one has been the death of the other. We have known of those whose death has been so terrible that it has caused the death of another. Both of these were being illustrated here. With his death, the mother's life was surely ended. Seeing him die this awful death, when the moment came, how could she but die with him? But Jesus would not have that to be. Mary's hour was not yet come. Though he died for many, yet would he have her live for many that out of many hearts thoughts might be revealed. There was work yet to be done by her in this valley of tears, and for the sake of that work he would have her live in it yet a little longer. Then must he devise some means to save her. Without him, her life would be a lonely life 
lonely unto death, unless some object worthy of her love were given to her, he must fill up the void in that mother's heart which his own death would inevitably make. He must transfer that mighty mother's love to another, give her a foster child whom she might cherish, and who in his turn might cherish her when he was gone. There was John at her side, John whom he had loved with a special love, whom also he had held to his heart. He would give them to each other. At the supper he had said to his own, In this shall men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. But this love should be even more. He had given a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Further than this he could not go, but in these two it should be perfectly fulfilled. They should find in each other the love they had hitherto found in him. They should give to each other what they could of the love they had hitherto given to him. Mary's love for John, because of, built upon, like to, the love she gave to Jesus, her son. John's love for Mary, because of, like to, his love for Jesus, his Lord. It was the perfect consecration and the consummation of human love. So by a new interchange of love would his mother be saved to live among men yet a little longer. If she would die of love, by means of love would she survive. So too would the disciple whom he loved have, even in this life, an ample reward for all the love he had shown his master. Having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them unto the end. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. After that he saith to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own. The gift of John to Mary and of Mary to John was the last will and testament of Jesus Christ our Lord. His life he had already given, his blood he was now pouring out to its last drop for all men. In this last gift he gave the only possession that remained. He bestowed on Mary the motherhood of all mankind. He bestowed on men his own mother to be theirs like his father through all the coming ages. The type had been fulfilled. Mary, the new mother of men, was made the second Eve. This was the first fruit of his bloodshedding. <laughs>